Welcome, Mike. Good to see you as ever. How you doing? It's been uh, an interesting month. We've had lots of uh, newsworthy stories which have captured the imagination of a lot of retail investors. And uh, top on the list there, I think, is actually GameStop, uh, which is a stock that not many people have probably heard of until last month. Um, but some really interesting things happening with it. Would you mind just describing what happened? Yeah, so this is a sort of a, a parable for our times. Uh, uh, GameStop, which is a, a relatively small kind of video and games uh, uh, retailer, during January alone uh, rose by, I think, 23 times in 11, 11 trading days. So that, that's off the scale of the behavior of any other kind of asset. And, and I think we, we've seen this amongst small cap stocks in the States. And what, what what's happening, um, I think, in the short term is you have retail traders in the States who are uh, maybe weaponized by trading platforms, by the use of leverage, uh, by the, the growing options market, options trading uh, volumes now are up about five times on the uh, over the course of the last year. So all these factors have been conspiring the last year to give more power to retail investors, certainly as far as the, the less liquid small stocks are concerned. Um, and then to complicate things, um, you had a number of hedge funds who were short, so they were trying to put sort of downside or selling pressure on the GameStop uh, stock. And as retail investors pushed it up, those hedge funds had to cover their positions and that pushed the stock up even, even further. Um, and then at the very, very pinnacle, I mean, it took on the, uh, the behavior of a full kind of trading mania. So I think if we, we just step back and think about the implications, we have a more balanced portfolio uh, approach. And many of the people who bought GameStop on the run-up uh, are now uh, down considerably. The stock is down 83% from the uh, from from the highs. Um, secondly, I think this is it points to to new trends in finance, uh, increased use of technology, uh, of uh, of platforms. Um, and, and I think to a resurgence of the retail traders, certainly in the US. Uh, I do think that in parts there will be a regulatory backlash um, against some of the trading platforms, maybe to make the, the, the options market a bit less um, dangerous to the stock market, if I can put it like that. And also I think some of the big hedge funds who've been implicated in this uh, will come under scrutiny. scrutiny. So this is a, it's one of these growing ecosystems that's kind of bubbling to the surface in a, in a volcanic way. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible five-year chart of GameStop. Now, <laughs> you just have this incredible spike uh, showing, and it's, uh, it's reminiscent of a Volkswagen incident in 2008. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I remember actually reading last month that um, once the retail investors had finished with GameStop, they were apparently going to target the silver market. Yep. Um, because they thought that would be open to uh, similar manoeuvring, shall we say. That doesn't look to have actually played out. It uh, doesn't, and I think the, the commodities market and the silver market is a different beast um, in, in terms of the people who trade it, uh, how they trade it, the mechanics uh, of that, and the, uh, the spike in silver prices was very, very short-lived. Um, and I guess a lot of people who weren't silver or commodity specialists uh, got burned. But, but I guess it's interesting as well because we, we have seen a lot of commodities rally because of the uh, the reflation trade, which we, we've talked about for some time now. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, at the forefront of our mind. Um, certainly when you look at the performance of some of the uh, more widely known commodities, so oil, for example, if we think back to this time last year, or March 2020, Oil actually went negative at one point, and now we're back to sixty dollars. And it, it kind of happened under the radar. I don't think a lot of investors have actually seen this, um, possibly because there's been other things happening. So GameStop yeah. and Bitcoin. I know we mentioned it again. We mentioned it last month, but this month is further developments on that front. Yeah. No, I mean Bitcoin is. It's again. It's another of these ecosystems um, that's now. I, I think become. Uh, symbiotically linked with uh, electronic vehicles because of Tesla buying Bitcoin. So what, I think what we're seeing is a number of things. I think there, there's growing acceptance of Bitcoin as a as a commodity, as a trading asset. Uh, more and more banks are willing to put it on their, their platforms. Um, I, I see very little 
growing evidence that Bitcoin is being used as a means of exchange, as a money, as a currency. And certainly you couldn't transact with a currency that, you know, in January was down 25% and then rallies 30%. You just, you just wouldn't know what to do with it. And it would cause economic chaos if we had something as, as volatile as that for, for money. Um, and that there are, you know, big questions as to who owns Bitcoin and who really uses it to, to transact. So I think it's kind of finding its place as an alternative asset, as a sort of a trading asset. Um, and you will probably through the course of this year see a debate amongst regulators as to whether they permit uh, Bitcoin ETFs and, um, you know, m more banks may take it on. Uh, perhaps against their, their their better judgment as a sort of as a, as a trading asset. So I think Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are here to stay. They're very correlated, uh, but they're here to stay as trading assets, not as currencies. Yeah, that's, that sounds uh, in line with my thinking. I must say. Um, now, part of the reason that people are looking at these alternative assets and, and their strong performance is because they're wondering if this is a side effect of all the um, plentiful liquidity that the central banks have pumped into this, the system uh, and also the fiscal policy moves that are uh, happening. Uh, we're seeing another round of stimulus uh, being debated in the US. That's a, that's a big number. Um, <laughs> we can go into that in just a second. Uh, but again, this all feeds into this reflation um, potential that yep. we have out there. and. For now, I think it's a good thing for portfolios, and I'll touch upon the positioning in just a second. Um, but as, as we go through the year, there will be a point where we have to get more mindful of the risks posed to the bond market yep. and uh, a potential of the 2018 scenario when we have bond yields rising and equities falling, which is, is a bad mix. But, but just for now, that, that stimulus in the US, it's $1.9 trillion they're talking about, just as we're getting everybody vaccin uh, vaccinated and we're starting to consider how we might open up. Yeah, I mean, Danger it, of overheating? The, the, there is, I think, but but I think many people will, will uh, willfully overlook that because you have three forces acting concurrently. You have the, the US Central Bank, which seems to be blind to all of these um, dislocations we, we've just talked about in markets. They seem to be blind to the fact that valuations for equities in the US are uh, as high as they were in 1999 and 1929. Um, so they, they continue to be quite generous. You have a huge fiscal response potentially on the way. Uh, and then you have potentially a decisive exit from, from COVID coming up. Um, and the question is, how do you play this as an investor? Um, we've already seen equity prices uh, reflate or inflate. Uh, the Russell 2000 in the States is, I think, 40% above its its average level, uh, moving average level, which has never happened before. Uh, and the risk actually is that this becomes expressed in a sell-off in bond prices. People think we're going to get a recovery in, in growth and inflation, which is bad for bond prices and yields begin to rise. We've already seen the US 10-year uh, yield hit 1.2%. So the risk, I suppose, in coming months is that bond yields uh, rise. Uh, and also, I think we have to keep an eye on the dollar, uh, where uh, investors are very short the dollar, um, and you know that, that could, could push back as well. Yeah, and, and actually on the bond yields point, it was quite interesting in January when we looked at uh, the performance of other wealth managers. And it's unusual to see the cautious or defensive portfolios actually underperforming yep. the medium risk portfolios in a down market. And that speaks to the risk of bond yields rising. Uh, and it's certainly something that we're, we're looking at. Um, we, we might take portfolio action in the near future to deal with. But for now, I, I think we are comfortable with our overweight equity position. Uh, that's working for us at the present. Uh, the small and mid cap exposure, the value exposure that we added in, uh, that's all working. So for now, we're probably going to hold firm, I think, Mike. I think so. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, just consider that bond exposure at some point in the near future. I'm not sure it will be next month or in a few months, but uh, that's one to keep an eye on. For now, thank you for joining us, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for chat. joining us.